Hello, my name is Dr. Phil Boyle. I am the director and founder of Neofertility.ie. We are a restorative reproductive medical clinic and I've worked in this area for the last 20 years. And for 15 of those years, I have prescribed low-dose naltrexone and I'm happy to share my experience of how this works for women's health. I have no conflict of interest regarding the use of low-dose naltrexone and I want to look at its implications in these six areas. Let's start with painful periods or the medical term dysmenorrhea. Painful periods are very common. Between 20 to 90 percent of women complain of painful periods. Severity can vary from cycle to cycle and the severity can be improved with exercise and stress reduction. The diagnosis is simple. It's from history. If a woman says she has painful periods that impair her ability to function normally, she has dysmenorrhea. And often it's because of a normal physiological process where prostaglandins and pro-inflammatory mediators cause uterine contractions, which are necessary to disrupt the blood supply to the endometrium leading to menstruation. And in some women, this can simply be quite painful and there's no pathology um, causing this. So other than a normal physiological process, if there's a serious issue behind that, it could be endometriosis is the most common complaint, up to 70% of women, or less commonly, there may be adenomyosis or pelvic inflammatory disease, and these would require medical attention. The typical treatment for dysmenorrhea is lifestyle, where you increase your exercise, you get more sleep, reduce stress and improve your diet. And many women will find when they do these things, painful periods will significantly improve. If this isn't enough, the next thing that's most commonly recommended are pain relievers with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Mephanamic acid or Ponstin is the most widely used one and ibuprofen or Nurofen is also very commonly used. Ideally, these medications should be started 24 hours before menstruation to give the optimum benefit. The oral contraceptive pill is an option to reduce period pain. Uh, the intrauterine device can help and ultimately laparoscopy may be needed to see is there underlying pathology which needs surgical attention such as pelvic adhesions or endometriosis. Well, where does naltrexone fit into all of this? Simply, it's not listed, but I would put it second on the list right after lifestyle interventions based on my clinical experience. Typically, I recommend starting with a three milligram dose every night for the first two weeks and thereafter 4.5 milligrams every night. The reason to start with a lower dose is to minimize the transitional side effects, which are quite common, such as vivid dreams and sleep disturbance. And once these side effects settle down, then I progress to using the slightly higher dose, provided we're getting benefit without ongoing side effects. Um, you just don't take this during the period of time, you take it constantly throughout the entire cycle. The reason for this is because there is persistent inflammation, if it's such as endometriosis, and to get benefit, you need to continue this throughout the cycle. There are other benefits from naltrexone that many women will experience and recognize that this is worth persisting with for longer throughout the cycle. Clinically, between 70 to 80% of women will improve dramatically with low-dose naltrexone. Many report reducing the dose of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or stopping them completely. Period pain can return during stressful events, um, so that don't worry if you find that the period pain comes crashing back one month. If you look at your lifestyle, you may recognize, oh, I had an illness at that time. There was a lot of stress. I wasn't sleeping. And you will find that when lifestyle improves and stress is reduced, the naltrexone will start to work again the following cycle. So intermittent disruption of the effectiveness of naltrexone is to be expected because of lifestyle stresses. There are no publications about this. 
And when you look at the licensed use of naltrexone, there's no question for a doctor who's not familiar with this, it is unsettling. It is a treatment that is licensed for opioid dependence, and it can cause life-threatening withdrawal symptoms if somebody is on an opioid and they add naltrexone. So for a doctor looking at opioid dependence, life-threatening symptoms, oh, I don't think I want to prescribe that. Uh, we're all painfully aware of litigation as well as the concern of any harm we may cause to our patients. But bear in mind, with low-dose naltrexone, we are using less than one-tenth of the actual licensed dose. Naltrexone is licensed at 50 milligrams. We're giving between 3 to 4.5 milligrams. And also, it's pretty easy to avoid morphine. I had one person who made that mistake, who was on morphine sulfate, and despite my advice, don't mix it this with morphine, um, she did, and she vomited for literally hours, and it was incredibly unpleasant. I've seen one of those in 15 years of practice, and I'll hopefully never see it again. Um, but there are less severe reactions um, interacting with codeine or alcohol, but morphine is very much to be avoided. <clears throat> The way we give low-dose naltrexone at night going to bed is a real advantage because the next day it's largely out of your system. So if you happened to need a morphine or an opioid the next day, it's safe to take it because the naltrexone is gone. Um, but just don't take naltrexone again that night or you will get the severe interaction. Furthermore, any doctor can do an N of 1 trial. Now, I just do this clinically, but I haven't made it a formal uh, study. N of 1 trials, you can look them up on Wikipedia. They've got a good explanation there. But it's a clinical trial in which your single patient is the entire trial, a single case study. You have an experimental intervention such as take low-dose naltrexone and a control intervention where you stop it. Here's a table trying to outline that strategy. And often you see the benefit when they take the naltrexone and the benefit disappears when naltrexone is discontinued. And there are various combinations of how you can do this and various degrees of uh, study that you can conduct. So uh, an option worth considering. And before long, you could have a case series put together where five or ten patients are put together. And next thing, we've got a possibility of submitting it for publication. N of 1 trials are useful to consider as a preliminary trial before going for more extensive, scientifically credible interventions, but in and of themselves, they are quite useful. Next condition, endometriosis. Endometriosis is where the lining of the womb that is usually shed with menstruation is found outside of the uterus where it shouldn't be. When you have endometrial tissue in the wrong place, it causes unpleasant symptoms, uh, very commonly dysmenorrhea or painful periods. Interestingly, there's a strong autoimmune association uh, with endometriosis. So women with endometriosis will commonly have other autoimmune conditions. It affects a lot of women with infertility and in our clinical experience, up to 50% of couples struggling with infertility, we will have some endometriosis present. Dr. Hilders, one of the leading authorities on restorative reproductive medicine, uh, published a study looking at the uh, endorphin levels in normal fertility controls compared to women who have endometriosis. And quite simply, he showed that if you have endometriosis with infertility, your endorphin levels are about half of what they ought to be compared to the normal fertility controls. So endorphin deficiency is associated with endometriosis. The best treatment for endometriosis is surgical excision. You remove the endometrial implants that relieves the inflammation, relieves the symptoms and improves fertility. But it is surgery and uh, not to be undertaken lightly. So often I would start with things like diet, where we avoid dairy, wheat and sugar. They're more pro-inflammatory foods and a wide range of autoimmune conditions respond favorably to this dietary strategy. In addition, supplements that contain high levels of vitamin D3 with omega-3 that is rich in EPA, 
uh, will also improve the immune system and reduce the inflammation. And then on top of that, we go for our typical dose of naltrexone, aiming for a maintenance dose of 4.5 milligrams, but starting with 3 milligrams nightly for the first two weeks. With 15 years of experience and over a thousand patients treated, I really should have done a publication at this stage specifically on endometriosis. Um, so that is on my to-do list. But 70 to 80% of women get an improvement in their painful periods. We get more pregnancies, we get fewer miscarriages, and we're more likely to see a full-term, normal weight, healthy pregnancy. I like what naltrexone does for our subfertile couples with endometriosis. But it's unpublished, and this is an issue. We need publications. So I probably have the most experience of anybody in the world giving low-dose naltrexone for endometriosis, and there's an onus on me to get my data out there to convince my peers, guys, this is something we really need to consider. Let's look at a patient testimonial, which is a more extreme version of what I would commonly see, uh, both in terms of her history and how well she responds. But it's good to give you some excitement about what naltrexone can do for endometriosis. She presented at the age of 27 with a history of five previous laparoscopies to treat moderate to severe endometriosis. Her symptoms were resistant to hormonal contraception and a, a GnRH analog. She used Dacapeptil. She had persistent uh, period pain and severe premenstrual symptoms. After treatment with naltrexone, I asked her to maybe write a, a, a story to capture what she had described to me in the consultation, and here's what she wrote. She said that low-dose naltrexone completely changed my life. I can now, for the first time in a very long time, say that I have a life. I can plan for the future without looking over my shoulder for the next attack of some symptom or infection. I did not only find improvement in my endometriosis symptoms, I have also seen premenstrual symptoms reduce to one or two days at most. No more persistent brown menstrual bleeding, depression and anxiety have gone. No more joint pain. I am currently on a lesser dose of medication for my underactive thyroid. There has been a complete transformation, not only physically, but also mentally and emotionally. I feel for the first time in my life like a complete human being, not just a multitude of symptoms. So this is profound for my patient and for me as a doctor, um, uh, helping somebody to that degree with a relatively simple intervention. So this is a huge attraction. Um, now, remember, it's not the only step. You should combine the diet and the supplements as well. She had done so much surgery that actually didn't help her. And she tried everything else available and look at the impact of this. Now, I have 20% of people who are resistant and there's a new treatment we have for the non-responders. Um, it's a, it's sympathomimetic treatment and it was pioneered by a Dr. Jerome Check. But that's for the resistant people. Definitely start with the low-dose naltrexone. It's simple and uh, to be very much to be considered. What about polycystic ovaries? So this is a normal appearing ovary and uh, it's a normal ovulation event. And before ovulation occurs, the woman produces a fluid-sized sister follicle that ruptures to release her egg. Uh, with polycystic ovaries, there are a high number of these small little follicles. And when you get lots and lots of little follicles, it interferes with the normal progression to ovulation. And women struggle to get a mature follicle and an ovulation event. Here's an ultrasound picture of polycystic ovaries. And to my mind, they, they should be called polyfollicle ovaries because it's more accurate. There are multiple little follicles there, not really cysts, even though it could be argued a follicle is a cyst. But in any case, loads and loads of follicles. And these follicles impair the ability of the follicle to mature, rupture, and release the you can have mild, moderate, or severe degree of polycystic ovaries in its most extreme form. You get three to four menstrual bleeds per year, acne, obesity, increased body hair, and infertility. With a mild form, you could have a regular cycle and no obvious clinical signs. And it, it isn't until you investigate and check for bloods and ultrasound that you actually find endometriosis is, or excuse me, polycystic ovaries are hiding there. 
and then moderate is somewhere in between the severe uh, symptoms or no symptoms at all. Interestingly, uh, again, studies from Dr. Hildres, who's one of the leading experts in restorative reproductive medicine with NAPR technology, when he uh, looked at his population of patients with polycystic ovaries, he found 50% of them also had endometriosis. So straight away, there's a 50% chance that women with polycystic ovaries will have endometriosis and straight away benefit from low-dose naltrexone. There are a whole litany of complications that can occur as a result of having polycystic ovaries. Too many for me to go into detail with here, but I just want to show you this. Look at the red areas. These are the things that are likely to improve from treatment with low-dose naltrexone. So even if there isn't endometriosis there, there are a whole load of additional factors that can respond favorably to treatment with endorphin stimulation from low-dose naltrexone. Interestingly, naltrexone has a very good effect on sugar regulation, which is one of the issues with polycystic ovaries. But good studies are needed. My clinical experience is not enough to convince my peers, oh, let's all try this. Um, they can do their end of one trials, they can use deductive reasoning, but until we get good publications, I think there will be a degree of resistance to people to even try this. But I would certainly encourage doctors working in this area, try it. Try it out and see what you think yourself. It's a little bit more complicated with polycystic ovaries because sometimes, it's the opposite thing we need to do. And we may need to block opioids with a high dose of naltrexone in less than 10% of cases. And in these situations, there are too many opioids um, causing irregular cycles and blocking opioid receptors is the actual treatment rather than stimulating them. So it leads to the question, well, what are we gonna do? Should we? boost endorphins with low dose naltrexone or block endorphins with a higher dose of naltrexone. So I use this as a clinical guide and women who would tick a number of these boxes for me are clinically endorphin deficient and would be worth a trial of low dose naltrexone to see does it give symptom relief and improve their well-being and ultimately their fertility. If we're considering high dose naltrexone uh, to block opioid receptors and restore a regular cycle, that's um, if for women who would be extremes of weight, very heavy or very light, uh, high amount of uh, persistent stress with the polycystic ovaries. What about premenstrual syndrome? Well, if you do a PubMed search, you'll find one publication on the use of low dose naltre of naltrexone rather uh, for the treatment of premenstrual syndrome. This was published by the Mayo Clinic in 1988. So let's have a look at what they did with naltrexone and PMS. Fantastically, we're not able to do this now, but at the time they were able to measure endorphin levels and they had normal uh, uh, levels of endorphins for women who had no premenstrual syndrome. And in the second half of the cycle, you could see significant endorphin deficiency in women who had strong premenstrual symptoms. So they conducted a 20-woman double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study uh, to treat proven endorphin deficiency on the premise, if you boost the endorphins, this should correct premenstrual syndrome. They used a menstrual distress questionnaire, which is a validated questionnaire, which means it's got um, scientific validity and credibility to properly assess the impact of premenstrual symptoms. But there was one major flaw in their study design. They felt they could boost endorphin levels in the second half of the cycle by blocking endorphins from days nine to 18 of the cycle. And the hope was when they would stop that endorphin blockade, they would get a, a, a consequent endorphin surge at the time when they wanted it uh, during the days where premenstrual symptoms would likely be present. Now they did get some benefit from doing this, but the benefits were limited because of side effects caused by the high dose naltrexone at 50 milligrams a day. What we all know in the low dose naltrexone world, what was needed was low dose naltrexone between three to 4.5 milligrams every night. 
So I'm currently president of the International Institute for Restorative Reproductive Medicine, and that's our website address there. And our French colleagues are in the midst of planning a clinical trial with low-dose naltrexone, copying the Mayo Clinic study design, except for the intervention arm, where the intervention will be low-dose naltrexone. I can tell you from my clinical experience already, we're anticipating an 80% positive response rate. And again, many women say to me, I have my life back, I'm me again. This is fantastic. So we're expecting, um, hopefully, uh, if you get a study, a good study conducted, we can convince the broader medical community with relatively small numbers in this study, it should not be that difficult to do, that this is a very worthwhile treatment. Um, Next up, reduced ovarian reserve or low AMH. This is where you start to run out of eggs. And here's a beautiful case study from Neve and David who went public um, after receiving treatment in our program and had two successful pregnancies with us. She was told at the age of 36, I was told I had the ovaries of a 46 year old and it was unlikely I would ever have my own genetic baby. Yet she went on and had two successful pregnancies with us. Her story is available on our website and on our Facebook page. She had a history of three failed IVF attempts using her own eggs and a fourth failed IVF attempt with donor eggs, which still didn't work for her. And I would argue that's largely because she didn't address the underlying immune dysfunction. I would further argue that IVF was not the correct treatment because she didn't have blocked fallopian tubes and the male factor was good. So why wouldn't you conceive naturally if you find and fix the root reason behind your subfertility? In addition to the immune modifying strategy with low dose naltrexone, uh, we applied uh, several hormone balancing strategies as well that we use with neofertility. So here again is your normal uh, ovary a representation of it. And the question is what's going on with reduced ovarian reserve? Well, quite simply, you're running out of eggs. But the fascinating thing is the reason you're running out of eggs is primarily because your immune system is attacking your ovary. Most of the time, it's an autoimmune process. So straight away in the LDN world, we're familiar with autoimmune things responding seven or eight times out of 10 to intervention with low dose naltrexone and this condition is no exception. So our strategy is follow the diet. We also eliminate eggs because there's a crossover with the protein code in eggs and the protein code in the human uh, egg and ovary. So we avoid milk, eggs, often wheat and sugar. You can do a blood test looking for IgG food antibodies, which in the broader medical world is not uh, widely recognized or accepted, but clinically works really well for us, especially in these scenarios. And it helps to focus uh, women on their diet. What do they really need to avoid? We go for supplements that contain vitamin D3 with omega-3, and then again, our typical dose of low-dose naltrexone. But that's our foundation, and it's most important that we implement a correct hormone balancing strategy on top of that. There are a number who will get pregnant just with this intervention alone, even with very difficult histories, but most of the time, uh, we get them to track their cycle with the Neo Fertility app. We monitor their hormones, and we boost and balance their hormones uh, as needed. So every clinic can come up with individual cases and we, we published, a, well, I presented rather to the Irish Fertility Society, a series of three case presentations, including Neve and David and two others who were all told they either needed donor eggs or failed donor eggs. Um, and I failed to convince my peers that uh, this is a real effect. So in 2015, we looked at all of our data for every couple who came through our program, and we focused on those with very low AMH. Uh, the group we looked at, the average female age was 37. Nearly 40% had already tried and failed an average of two IVF, IVF cycles. 46% had previous miscarriages. Over half, 54% never conceived naturally, and almost 70% had no previous live birth. The average AMH value was 0.1 nanograms per mil, according to the American units, or 1.3 picomoles per, mil, per liter uh, with the European units. Most fertility clinics would agree this population should be looking at donor eggs as the best intervention to solve their fertility problem. We would propose through restorative reproductive medicine and neo-fertility 
combined with low-dose naltrexone, there is another way. And in fact, there's no rush if you're looking at donor eggs because you could do those at any age. And the simple rule of thumb is, if you still have a monthly cycle, no matter how low your AMH is, we could work with that and we may be able to help you get there naturally. Um, so how did we do? Well, 54% of this difficult population conceived with our treatment. 35% of them had a live birth. All babies were born at full term. There were no twins, no premature births, and the average birth weight was 3.2 kilos or seven pounds, two ounces. This is a very good outcome for a very difficult um, subfertile group. Ordinarily, we would expect a 50% live birth rate with our typical population of patients, but we, and we would expect it to be somewhat lower considering the challenge that this group presented. But you could see it, it compares very favorably uh, to any kind of intervention, including even donor eggs. Finally, let's consider some co new concepts regarding improving uh, pregnancy outcomes and achieving healthy pregnancy. If you improve the health of the couple preconception by improving egg quality and sperm quality, then uh, you will get better pregnancy outcomes. We find we get a higher conception rate and more pregnancies, a reduced miscarriage rate, reduced incidence of premature delivery, and a lower incidence of low, low birth weight and generally healthier babies. Low-dose naltrexone is a key component to helping us achieve these improved outcomes. So with a focus on having babies, we think a lot of this is because if you continue the anti-inflammatory, immune-modifying benefits that naltrexone gives us, and we continue that during pregnancy, you're going to improve all of these pregnancy outcomes. But now we're starting to get ambitious for even more. And there are two things in particular we're considering. One is, is it possible that we might be able to reduce the incidence of autism spectrum disorder? Well, there are publications that will show there's an autoimmune component to the development of autism, where the mother is shown to uh, produce anti-brain antibodies um, that increase the likelihood that her, her children may have autism spectrum disorder. We hypothesize with our immune modifying strategy, diet, naltrexone and supplements, that we should be able to reduce the incidence, severity and frequency of autism spectrum disorder for women who would continue with low dose naltrexone throughout most of their pregnancy till at least 37, 38 weeks gestation. We haven't proven this, but we're beginning to explore the possibility this may be true. There's a fourth one we can add in that I'm not going to talk about. It's, a, it's an additional treatment uh, that's worth considering. Um, but naltrexone is, is our current number one. Furthermore, we're even looking at the possibility of positive, positively impacting epigenetic changes. Um, for example, endometriosis, there is a genetic component where a, a woman with endometriosis becomes pregnant, has her baby, the baby is a female, her daughter is much more likely to have endometriosis as well. Part of this is because of the genes that she carries, but the other part are the conditions that surround the genes, and these are called epigenetic uh, issues, things surrounding the genes that cause them to switch on or off. So we can positively influence gene expression by reducing inflammation, which reduces methylation, and ought to reduce the expression of endometriosis in the next generation. So this is just outrageous, um, but it's possible absolutely unproven but possible but a hypothesis that i would love to test and there may be other benefits there has to be more benefits as well because i think we're only just getting started with all of this and it's right and prudent to be cautious about giving anything during pregnancy because the history of things like thalidomide and diethyl stilbestrol but we, we ought not to let that paralyze our creativity to look at the potential of what we may be able to achieve by reducing inflammation and improving endorphins, improving health and well-being for both, both mom and baby. More study is desperately needed. 
So I've pulled together some of these ideas uh, in a presentation that's available on our, on our website at neofertility.ie, where we look at 120 pregnancies where we used naltrexone. Um, this isn't the last word on it by any means. Uh, we didn't observe any adverse effects. You'll need tens of thousands of people using naltrexone before you could absolutely say it's definitely safe. Um, the reason we started doing it is because we kept losing our pregnancies and we've got fewer losses because we're giving naltrexone. I see parents coming in with their children uh, tr well, trying for another pregnancy and they say this little guy was on naltrexone for our whole pregnancy and look how good he is. He's healthy, he's a good eater, he's a good sleeper, he's hitting his developmental milestones. We think he's really bright and I think there's something in that. So the presentation uh, you could look up at, uh, at any other time may explain this further. So here's to the next generation. Thank you for listening to this talk. Bye for now.